Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Today we have Harris Kupperman, who is the CIO of Praetorian Capital. So how are you doing, Harris? Hope you're doing, doing well. great, thanks. So before we start talking about investments and all that, could you tell us a bit about your background? How did you get interested into finance and how did you start getting into the field? Sure. Uh, I started trading stocks my senior year of, uh, sorry, in, in uh, boarding school, my senior year in boarding school. Um, I had been watching the Asian financial crisis on the, the TV and I saw all these people running around wearing suits, losing fortunes. And I figured if they were losing fortunes, someone was making fortunes and I wanted to be that guy who was making fortunes. And I took a few thousand dollars that I had saved up uh, from uh, cleaning pools one summer and I opened a brokerage account, tried to figure it out. And, you know, it took me quite a while to figure it out, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the biggest riddle and puzzle out there, but you, no one ever fully figures it out, but you know, trying to figure it out, it's a lot of fun. And so I found something that I was passionate about. Okay, so how did you go about starting a, a hedge fund, a Praetorian Capital? So how did you start that hedge fund? How was the process? <laughs> it was a probably dysfunctional process. Uh, I had been giving some stock tips out to some of my dad's golfing buddies and they had made a lot of money actually. And you know, the problem with giving stock tips is you never tell people when to sell. You just, have, I mean, you just forget who you told what to. And so I suggested that a few of these guys uh, invest in a fund uh, and they said yes. And uh, we, we launched a fund, uh, about a dozen guys each chipped in about uh, 25 to 50,000 each. It was a small fund at, at the beginning. But the returns were very strong and eventually they told their wealthier friends and I had a fund. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the event driven monitor that you do. So could you, oh, tell, uh, could you tell the listeners what you do with the event driven monitor? How should they use it? And uh, I just have a very like uh, question. Why are you doing this for free? <laughs> I mean, it looks like it takes you a lot of time. So why, why are you doing this for free? It won't be free much longer. Um, you know, we have some uh, issues on our side with data integrity that we're working on. And so uh, we, we don't mind uh, giving it to people for free while we sort through some of these issues. Uh, we're also looking for an analyst to, uh, I guess, make it so that we spend a little less of our time. Uh, there's actually a few of us doing it now. <clears throat> but in terms of uh, the monitor, it's called uh, uh, Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor. You can uh, see uh, and you can subscribe at uh, KEDM.com. And uh, please sign up. It's still free for the next month or two. Um, but I've been trading event driven strategies for 20 years now, but I never really did anything systematic. And um, what I found coming out of uh, the crisis uh, last year was that some of these strategies just started doing a lot better than I ever expected them to. And uh, I asked a friend of mine to uh, build a giant spreadsheet to start tracking these. And I didn't realize just how big of a test this was. Uh, I thought it'd be a few weeks and then we could go back to doing our job. But as he started building it, I realized just how much I had missed over the last few years. And quite honestly, I left millions of dollars on the table. But, but then also, as we started building it out, we realized that a lot of the data that we wanted doesn't really exist, or the data comes in and it, it needs to be cleaned up, it's buggy. Uh, a lot of the stuff with the most uh, opportunity has to be manually put together. You can't just pull it off a of Bloomberg. And so uh, my friend, I asked him to join me full time in uh, building this. Um, and uh, I sent this to a few of my friends because I thought it'd be helpful to them. You know, I was just using this for my, my hedge fund to trade uh, and make money for my clients. And they started saying, hey, Cuppy, uh, why don't you, you know, put me on a list and send it to me each week. And a PDF, I mean, uh, an Excel spreadsheet became a PDF. And then I realized that I needed to hire a couple of analysts to do this. And, you know, I'm not going to subsidize my friend's research budget. And so I decided we're, we're going to eventually build this into a business. So it's self-sustaining. Uh, you know, I think charitable things don't work if it's not revenue. And I don't expect this to be, you know, amazingly profitable or anything, but you know, I, I'd be very happy if we cover our costs and, you know, if we earn a profit, we can, you know, keep putting that into building the data better. Uh, but, um, you know, right now we've done, uh, I've been surprised by how many people have uh, signed up uh, in, in terms of uh, just the demand and uh, the feedback I've gotten. You know, clearly we built something that a lot of people have wanted and no one had thought to build it just because it's really hard to build. 
Uh, we have about 20 more strategies we want to add. There's about 25 strategies there right now. Uh, but what's I think very unique about it is that almost every newsletter uh, out there, every uh, product out there in the stock market, it, it's designed to, to say buy this, sell that. It, it's not, there's very few things that are designed to say, look, something's going to happen next week. There's a corporate action. Uh, you have a week's uh, notice to go learn about the corporate action and see if you care. But we're not taking a side if you should buy or sell. We're just telling you something's about to happen. And, you know, we're proud that, uh, you know, for us, success means that something happens and the shares move. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of looking at the unlocks of uh, the recent IPOs. I mean, we saw some heavy selling from all the unlocks. So, I mean, just recently, Coinbase is not an unlock, but we've seen huge selling from them. So what do you think? Is this a sign of anything or is this just normal? We always see huge selling from unlocks. Well, when you look at these sort of strategies, they go in cycles, which is why, you know, we have over 20, we're adding 20 more. You have strategies that really don't produce a lot of alpha for a period of time, and then they become amazingly lucrative. And then, you know, they go through another cycle where they don't produce a lot of alpha. And so uh, unlocks when you're in a bull market, you know, the, there's always more buyers and sellers and it gets absorbed. When you're in a transition to a bear market, which I, what I think we're in right now, or at least a bear market in Ponzi sector, um, a lot of these Ponzi sector companies, when uh, you know the, the unlock, and an unlock is when uh, insiders have restricted stock that they're finally allowed to sell. Uh, wh wh when these unlocks come, a lot of shares hit the market, and there's not enough uh, buyers to absorb them, and the stocks drop. And you can literally short the stock a few days before the unlock, and I think 80% of them have declined in the week after. If you look on uh, the adventure of a monitor. Uh, on the unlocks, we flagged all the ones that are down, uh, I think down 5% or something. And it's like 80% of them are orange. It's just free money on the screen. And this will last for a while. And then, you know, it, it, the share prices will find a base where, you know, they're, they're fairly valued or undervalued. And then some other strategy will work. But, you know, the point of my commentary at the beginning of each one of these articles is to kind of flag what we see internally as working and not working. because. There's over 100 pages now of data and it's going to get longer, hopefully. And so uh, I want to flag, hey, check this section, check that section. You know, this section, I don't think there's much going on right now, but the data is there if you want to play with it. I mean, every unlock I've seen just the day before it just goes down five, six percent. So, I mean, I'm not in the market for a long time, but it, it looks very lucrative to trade. So you've mentioned uh, the, the Ponzi sector. What is the Ponzi sector in your view? Okay. Which companies would you say are Ponzi's? So to me, the Ponzi sector is a giant group of companies that uh, have no path to profitability, but show dramatic revenue growth. And they issue uh, debt and equity to acquire customers. Often they're stealing customers from companies that have a profit motive. And they're giving away a dollar for 80 cents and hoping to make it up on volume. And as long as you keep doing this and someone is willing to fund it, you can show really, really uh, aggressive revenue growth. And everyone keeps talking about how Amazon grew very fast in the early years and lost money. I think people forget that Amazon had a business plan that eventually got it to be profitable. You know, they had operating leverage and Amazon didn't even lose that much money along the way. A lot of these companies, um, they actually have negative operating uh, leverage. As they grow, the revenues larger, you know, the, the margins shrink and you don't have any scale against fixed costs. It's actually kind of surprising. These are just pure Ponzi schemes and the venture capitalists and the insiders sell as stock as fast as they can and hope someone funds it so it just keeps going. And there's hundreds of these companies now. So since you're, uh, I don't know how would you label yourself as an event-driven investor or something like that? I do three things uh, uh, in terms of strategy. The core of what I do is small companies growing very rapidly. That's uh, how I've made most of my money in my life. That's my passion. Unfortunately, right now, small companies that are growing rapidly, they're not undervalued. They're not even fairly valued. They're egregiously expensive. So we've gone and looked for other places to make money. Uh, we've done a lot of inflection investing lately. This is companies that are cyclical, that... Uh, you know, just, just have earnings volatility that are in some sort of transition. But there's a lot of opportunity here because Wall Street does a great job of taking 
a company that has linear revenue growth or earnings growth and just extrapolating for 10 more years and then putting a multiple uh, out 10 years. <clears throat> Wall Street does a terrible job of looking at companies with earnings volatility quarter to quarter, year to year, and figuring out what the you know, free market, the private market would pay for this asset. And so you have a lot of situations where these uh, companies swing violently between undervalued and overvalued, often over a five-year period. And so it gives uh, guys like me that have been at this game for too long uh, uh, and, and, and understand the cycles, an opportunity to kind of buy at the inflection at the bottom of the cycle and sell at the top of the cycle and just basically play what's in reality like a big sign curve. And then finally, a venture of an echoes in cycles, you know, there was a period of time from like 2016 and 17, where realized volatility was very low and there just wasn't a lot to do on the event driven side. And you have periods like right now where realized volatility is very high and it's pretty much all I do. I mean, I've taken down my long only book uh, quite dramatically because I don't see a lot of value stocks. And I've you know repositioned our capital and you know our energy into event driven because it just continues to produce uh, returns and they're very consistent returns. I want to mention on the event driven side that I find a lot of people make the mistake of looking at one or two events, playing them big and uh, they get upset. Uh, this is about uh, never having one loss ever move your numbers and really not even one win moving your numbers. Though sometimes, you know, a win can just keep trending and it does a lot better than you expect. It's really about having a big diversified book and playing these strategies and knowing that the law of, of averages and odds are on your side. And so I want to just stress that when you, you look at event driven. So you're not targeting thousands of percentages while having a huge risk, you're targeting, uh, you know, average returns that are above the markets that are low with, uh, in volatility. That's what, should, what you're saying, event driven. I think on the capital employed event driven, you should target to a few percent a month uh, on that capital and uh, do it in a very diversified way. Of course, that doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you're gonna lose money. Sometimes you're gonna do a lot better than you expect. But I feel like you can make a few percent a month in a very consistent way. And you know, through compounding, it, it ends up adding up quite fast. And you know, eventually you're gonna have one of those you know, great trades where something really goes surprisingly well for you. You'll have a few where you, you know, you're, you're amazed at how badly it goes. But um, I just think it, it produces very consistent returns. And the more volatile the market is, uh, the better the returns will be. I think right now why it's doing so well is that uh, we have this weird dynamic where passive is taken over from active investors. And so when there's a corporate action, uh, passive just has a universe, that, a rule book that says, if something happens, we have to do this. And a lot of the, the, the rule book for passive is based on market cap. And it's not, you know, hard coded for things like spinoffs or, you know, special dividends or um, you know, tender offers and these sort of things that um, just aren't built into the rule books of an ETF. And it creates a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, at the same time, you have this army of newly minted day traders that really don't have a lot of experience and they tend to move in giant herds based on a TikTok video or something. And you know, they, they create these weird uh, aberrations in the market that I think you can uh, take the other side of, uh, especially because they tend to overpay for call side volatility, which means that uh, you know, put side volatility is overvalued too. And there's opportunities to write puts. There's opportunities where they're just off sides on things that make no sense. I mean, I can give you lots of examples, but it, I mean, there's been surprisingly lucrative things you can do in the market over the past uh, year based on uh, these guys being idiots and not understanding what they own. Uh, so with what's happening in the market right now, I've seen you talk about Bitcoin. You've owned it, you've sold it. So what is your thesis on Bitcoin currently? Why do you own it or not own it? I'm not sure on which side you're on right now. I have no position right now. Um, you know, I don't know if I'll be involved in the future or not. I, I bought mine at about 9,200. Uh, <clears throat> I, I noticed that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust was uh, accumulating coins and taking them off uh, off the exchanges. I noticed a bunch of other uh, entities like Grayscale, like I call them the QSIPs, that were consolidating the the stack of coins, and I just felt like uh, I had a 
place in the chart to risk a few hundred dollars, two, three hundred dollars and see what happened. Um, you know, Bitcoin ended up getting to 60,000. Uh, I sold mine in the high 50s. Um, I had no real reason for selling. It was more that uh, when I got in, I looked at a spot in the chart and I said, I'm, I'm not really risking much. And when I looked at it at uh, 60,000, I said, I don't know which direction the next 20,000 is. I have no opinion here. And I don't like trades or investments where I have no opinion. I want to you know, know that um, data is on my side. And I looked at it being a trillion dollar asset and those don't usually double and triple again. And there's a lot of things on my screen that I think could uh, go up 10 times from here. So it just seems like a good play, good, good time to reallocate my capital. And then finally, the Ponzi sector, it, it's kind of been rolling over for the past few months. And, you know, the people who own Tesla and the, the people who own, you know, uh, space fraud, like they tend to be the people that own Bitcoin. And so, um, you know, I, I assume that if they, uh, you know, they start losing money in one place, they're going to have to sell some Bitcoin to average down or deal with margin calls. And, so I just kind of looked at it and looked at a shareholder base that looked pretty terrible and um, decided that it was, it was a big win. I had a five bagger, almost a six bagger. You don't get too many of those in eight months. And, you know, especially when it's a uh, position limit. And I just decided I'm going to declare victory. Uh, I have no great uh, thesis on my timing. I got lucky, quite honestly. Uh, so you've mentioned things on your screen that you think are, are 10 baggers. Could you tell us some of those or? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I want to go too far down that road. I mean, a lot of the things I own are uh, very good. Um, you know, some, some of them I've spoken about, you know, I own a lot of uh, St. Joe. I think, uh, you know, depending on how that plays out, that could easily be a 10 bagger from here. Um, uh, let me stick with that one as my potential 10 bagger. There's a lot of doubles and triples that are super low risk because when you buy something that's growing fast at three to five times earnings, you know, just getting to a market multiple, uh, excluding any growth or any capital retained, uh, you know, it's going to give you a three to five bagger. Um, and there's a lot of those. I mean, I'm really bullish on the housing sector, you know, playing that forward. Uh, I think a lot of the energy services names are really attractive here just because quite a few of them came through the ringer in terms of uh, bankruptcy where they cut a lot of debt. But, and you're buying a bunch of equipment for far less than replacement cost uh, at a time when the number of drill rigs is increasing for the first time in years. Um, you know, there's the, the sectors like that that are really attractive, but quite honestly, I have a lot of cash right now. Uh, I haven't really been finding anything interesting. Um, now, I'm one of those guys that uh, when the world's freaking out, I like to buy stuff. And when uh, the market's gone straight up for a year, I like to sell it back to them. You know, I'm not usually the type to be buying uh, up here. I I'll wait for something crazy to happen in the world and it it'll be the whole market or it'll be one sector, but uh, we'll uh, buy it back uh, when someone's panicking. And in, you know, the, in the interim, we're gonna do this event driven thing because uh, it's valuation agnostic, it's diversified, and you, know, you could basically do it with uh, you know, Delta neutral almost where you've got equal dollars at risk on the long and short side and you just, betting that the, you know, the, the events you're flagging are probabilistic. And so far, I've been doing a great job at it. So we've seen the market just go parabolic. Uh, do you ever take the short side on the markets? Uh, do you think it's a good time to take the short side? Or you, you don't want to bet against the trend? Oh, I, I never short. Um, or almost never. Uh, shorting is really hard. The most you can make is 100%. Uh, you're betting against, uh, you know, people who want their stocks to go higher. You're betting against the government who wants the market higher. You're betting against central bankers who want the market higher. It's a really tough bet to make. And it's so easy to find a cheap company that can go up a few times. It's just, I'd rather make a few hundred percent on something where if it drops 10% or 20%, I'll just buy more. Because I, I like the people involved and maybe the company will buy some more and maybe management will buy some more. I like situations like that where the cheaper it gets, the better the deal is for me. I mean, if you have some company and it goes uh, up and you're short, like you can't really add to it because you're already short and it's already gotten to be a bigger position because it went up. It, it just, you know, numbers wise, it's a terrible place to be and I don't, I don't want to be there. Um, in terms of the market, I don't know what the event is that'll make it drop. Maybe it won't. Um, 
you know, I have this Project Zimbabwe thesis, which is that uh, between the central bankers printing money and uh, the, the fiscal uh, spending, which has gone crazy, uh, there's so much liquidity that maybe markets can't ever draw. And so um, maybe we don't ever go down. I, I don't really know. I, I, I think at any one time you could have a 10 or 20% drop. I mean, this arc, arc goes, uh showed that any stock can trade almost anywhere, even in a bull market. But you know, bigger picture, I think you want to be long if they're going to print money. So you, you think the market is going to be resembling Zimbabwe in any way, in, in the sense yeah. of inflation, I'm guessing? Or... <laughs> Yes, I think you're going to see a lot of inflation, a whole lot of inflation. I think uh, the market's just going to keep going up because they just flooded the market with liquidity, even though the market's kind of choking on liquidity. And it has to go somewhere. And it'll um, go into the market, it'll go into the housing market, which is basically the other you know, main asset that uh, middle class wealthy people uh, use to store their worth. You know. And so that's why I'm so bullish on housing and I'm so bullish in the market. You know, I think if you're going to hand out checks to people and you're going to give people access to almost unlimited borrowing capacity, they're going to borrow and buy another home. They're going to buy a third vacation home because if the vacation home is appreciating 20% a year and it costs 4% a year to fund it, why wouldn't you? And so that, that's, I think, what's going to happen. That's why I think you know, housing, commodities, um, like sectors like that, the overall market, I think there's a lot of things that are going to do very well in this cycle. Uh, I also think you uh, want to be a little careful because it's gone straight up and things don't usually go straight up. And every reading, you know, valuation wise and sentiment wise is at, uh, you know, pretty historic extremes. And, you know, from those sort of extremes, you tend to have pretty nasty shakeouts along the way. And, you know, times like right now, it's probably a good time to be building a shopping list of stuff you want to buy on the next shakeout. So in normal markets, you would go and buy uh, small companies that are growing fast, right? Currently, you're not finding much of those at a cheap price. I'm finding a few of them, but not that many. And so, you know, what I'm finding a lot of our inflection situations where you have a business, it's a good business, it's done poorly for a while, and I think it's going to get better. Like, let's talk about energy services. Uh, the number of drill rigs in the U.S. has declined pretty much in a straight line since 2014. There's been some upticks and some downticks. I think you could say the same about energy spending globally. And you have a lot of these companies that have done a, every year, year after year, they just cut costs, they've taken capacity out. And oil is at 60 right now. And uh, I think spending will pick up going forward. I mean, we've seen this where rigs almost went to zero. And you're almost every week for six months now, the rig count goes up in the US. And uh, I assume uh, spending will go up globally next year if oil stays at 60. And so um, I, I think that's a place you want to be because these things are often. I mean, they're, they're basically being priced like they're going bankrupt again, but a lot of them already went bankrupt once. They cut a lot of their debt and you're buying a bunch of uh, equipment at a time when the, when the equipment's going to be needed and you're paying 50 cents on the dollar for steel. And I, I tend to think that uh, that's a good price because at the top of the cycle, you usually trade it two or three times the value of the equipment because uh, you know, the equipment earns very high returns on capital. So I, I like stuff like that where you're looking at something and you're saying, I think I'm getting a bargain here and I think I'm getting an inflection. And, um, you know, you're not, you're not going to get all of them right. You're probably going to get, you know, only some of them right. But if you get it right, you make five or 10 times your money. And if you get it wrong, you probably get your money back because these things aren't really losing any money right now. And the steel is still there next year. So just like yeah. tankers, for example, right? Uh, I have. I have no tankers outside of one company that uh, owns uh, very large gas carriers. Uh, propane demand in Asia is rapidly growing and someone has to get the propane there. Um, and I think that um, you know, demand for these tankers will continue to stay elevated for, for a long period of time. There's not a lot of new supply coming. And uh, particularly in the US as the export of uh, NGLs or the production of NGL starts increasing again because of drilling, uh, I think uh, you're gonna see basin differentials between uh, 
you know, the, the price in the Gulf of Mexico and the price in Asia, which will create arbitrage situations, uh, which, which has been in place until quite recently, actually, because U.S. Uh, uh, NGL production has kind of uh, flatlined for a while. But what's different this cycle than last cycle is we have a lot of export capacity that we didn't have last cycle. So as the U.S. starts producing more NGLs, uh, we actually can export them. And I think you're going to see a situation where uh, the total ton miles for these carriers expands. And I think it's going to be very good. I like situations like that. I mean, uh, you know, the, the company I own called Dorian, uh, they just did a Dutch tender and they bought back like 15% of the company last month or two months ago. I like situations like that where there's a lot of cash flow, the insiders own a lot of stock and they're, they're, they're increasing my ownership using that cash flow. Um, so anyway, that, that's my only uh, shipping company. I think tankers are going to struggle for the next year or so. There's been almost no scrapping uh, and uh, there's been a decent amount of supply added. And OPEC is still, uh, you know, in reduced product production mode, which means that you have less demand for tankers at a time when the global fleet keeps expanding. So uh, it, it's a tough place to be if you own tankers. Yeah, the market has not given tankers any love for, I think, decades. <laughs> so uh, it's 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 very cheap right now. But you have a great point. The supply just keeps on growing, so the market might might be right. It's set up very well when I bought tankers in uh, early 2019, going into IMO 2020. Uh, you know, you had uh, petroleum demand, especially, especially seaborne petroleum de demand expanding at a time when the fleet was somewhat constricted. And, you know, for the first time in 10 years, in 2019, these companies earned uh, quite a lot of money. Then with COVID and Super Contango, for the first half of 2020, they earned uh, unfathomable amounts of money. And... I felt real smart about it. And then we got into this world where OPEC's not really exporting that much and the, the tankers have struggled. And so I sold mine. I made some money on it. I didn't make a lot of money because uh, I mean, I had a lot of doubles and triples and I ended up making 20 or 30%. I gave back a lot, but I recognized what was happening, but that's how it happens when you do inflection investing. Um, you know, a lot of times it doesn't hit escape velocity and you end up making or losing a little bit of money. In this case, I bought it so cheaply, I made a little, which is kind of the point. Uh, but, you know, we started getting to escape velocity. I looked really smart. And then in the end, it just didn't work. And they basically all round tripped. Uh, many of them are below my purchase price. Uh, so I'm glad I cut when I did. But um, you know, when, you, when you're doing inflection investing, you have to be uh, very focused on what's happening in the sector and is it getting better or worse. The, the U.S., uh, just to shift a little, the U.S. market is objectively expensive, right? And also with the, with the influx of uh, new traders, like everything is being bought up. Do, do you see any uh, like uh, reward in other markets? I think other markets aren't as expensive as the U.S. So have you ever looked at them or are you just U.S. only? look globally i think you have to i just don't know the companies as well you know a lot of what you're doing when you're investing is trying to figure out uh what you don't know uh everything you need to know about a company backwards looking is in a bloomberg and so when you see something cheap the first thing you ask yourself is what's not in that bloomberg that the local guys who know the management team personally that are looking at this stuff daily what do they know that I don't know? And um, I'm at a huge disadvantage. If something happens in the US, I've probably, in my universe of companies, I've probably met the management team once or twice in the last five years, just because I've got a lot of conferences. I have friends who are large shareholders. I can ask them what they think. I just have a lot of competitive advantages here in the US that I don't have overseas. We do some uh, investing in uh, Canada, but outside of that, I just don't have any edge because I don't know the people. Um, I would think that, uh, you know, I'm going to do better in the U.S., quite honestly, even though the values are uh, quite cheap in some countries. And maybe I should be putting more energy there. So, so you, you would advocate uh, speaking to management if you could. Well, you want to have every advantage you can get in investing and, you know, Management, I don't speak to them that much in terms of figuring out what next quarter looks like. I don't feel that it helps me. 
what I'm trying to figure out is what their five and 10 year plans are and what they're thinking about and how they're trying to understand their business. Uh, I usually prefer to speak with the competitors, quite honestly, because the competitors will tell you what's broken. Uh, management will just mostly lie to you and make you want to buy some stock. And uh, as I said, I, I've met management. I hear them at conferences. I feel like I know some of these guys reasonably well. But you know, it, it's the competitors. It's the customers. It's uh, the people they're doing business with that I think you get more information from. And you know, in the US, I've built up huge Rolodexes of that stuff too. And so I just would rather focus where I know. Uh, but you, it's never wrong to talk to management. Just be skeptical. Yeah, that's the risk of speaking to management. They have a, they have an incentive for you to buy their stock. Uh, so, could you tell us one one of your best investment or worst investment, and what have you learned from it? Hmm. I think the best investment in terms of percent upside was a company called US Global. I bought them in 2003 or maybe 2004. And at the time they managed mutual funds that uh, invested in, in commodities, uh, Eastern Europe and gold. And those were three things I was very bullish on in 2003. And I invested at a time when they had less than a billion of assets under management. And over the next three years, they ended up having some of the best performing uh, funds in uh, the US. They attracted almost 6 billion of assets and the earnings went from a penny or two uh, a quarter to a few dollars a quarter because I got the macro theme right that uh, commodities would do well and investors would go find those commodities. And the stock went from about $3 to $80 in about three years. And uh, it was my largest position because I was, I'd met management, but he was, uh, still think he is a stand-up guy. And I thought he was very bright and I met the marketing people. And I thought that if the numbers were good on the performance, they'd be able to raise money. And I was right. And it was a phenomenal investment. And I, I wish they'd all be that good. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing you don't want to talk about your worst. <laughs> no, I'll talk about, I mean, I've had lots of stocks that go to zero. It just, uh, sometimes you get it wrong. I've never had one that went to zero on fraud, accounting restatements. Like I don't get hurt there. I'd say where I most often get hurt is that I don't understand the competitive position of a, of a business. And it's cheap because other people understand that the business is going to be obsolete or there's a new competitor that's taking market share. And I don't understand it. And it keeps the stock keeps going lower and I keep buying more because it stays cheap. And then all of a sudden the bottom drops out of the business and everyone else knew it but me. And so that's usually where I get hurt, uh, particularly stuff with obsolescence. Um, you know, I'm not on the cutting edge of anything. I'm not a tech person. And I don't sometimes uh, see what's about to happen next. And so that, that's where I get hurt. Um, so what is your advice to all the newcomers in the market right now? Uh, what would you give them as an advice if they were to listen to you? Uh, the stock market is just uh, 200 years of uh, cycles that repeat. And you need to learn your history. And no matter what sector you're looking at, what currency you're looking at, what commodity, what, what individual stock, even the whole broad market, you need to look back in history, decide you know, what this mirrors in your mind and uh, figure out what the playbook was. Uh, the great thing is that we have 200 years of history in the US, about the same amount of time in Europe, you know, 50 years in most of Asia. There's a lot of uh, history with very detailed data and you got to figure out what each scenario looks like and how it's going to repeat. And most everything you know happened already. You just got to figure out where we are in the cycle and be true to yourself and not, not go out there and saying, I, I know everything, I've learned everything, I've researched everything. Just say, you know, this could be like this, you know, like, like this event, it can, maybe it could be like this event, maybe it's gonna be like this other event. And you watch all three play out and figure out which, as the data comes at you, you know, you adjust your view. 
and you need to be very flexible, but this is all just history and action. It keeps repeating. And, uh, you know, going out there and saying, I think this stock is cheap. That doesn't mean anything because Bloomberg has all that. And going out there and chasing the next fad, that doesn't mean anything because that's how you lose money. Uh, you know, the only way you don't lose money is if you can look at that fad and say, this uh, mirrors this other thing. And I think it's going to keep going for a while, you know, but it, uh, that's just using your historical uh, references. And that's why I say to anyone, go read some history. Don't read finance books. Don't talk to other finance people. Whatever you do, do not talk to anyone uh, at an investment bank. They'll just sell you nonsense. Uh, just, just learn your history. Uh, that's a great point on the flexibility standpoint. I think being flexible is a huge advantage in the market. Most people are just arrogant. They think they're always right. That always ends up uh, being a loss. Uh, so, usually. Usual. So thank you, Harris, for... Uh, being here today. I hope the listeners uh, got some value out of this. I hope everyone who likes this, they would share this to someone who they think uh, would gain value from this. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Harris, for coming here. See you all. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And hope the internet connection is good. <laughs>